Hi everyone, and welcome back to World History to 1500. Um, this uh, lecture is going to be on Tang Song China, one of my favorite periods in history, in Chinese history, and just in general. Um, I think it's a very interesting period. Uh, the Tang and Song are often combined together uh, in looking at kind of a long uh, expansion of Chinese civilization, Chinese culture, um, especially in terms of things like technology and literacy and culture in general, the arts. Um, and sometimes the Song and Tang are seen as perhaps the first modern society on earth, or there are arguments to this effect, and I'm going to let you be the judge of that. Um, but uh, I'm going to dive right in here. I'm not going to give you a big intro because this will be a longer lecture, probably about an hour. I'm going to try not to go over an hour, uh, at least not too much, um, but I'm packing a lot in today. Um, today's uh, lecture aligns with uh, textbook chapter 12. I've assigned page 270 to 291, and I'm kind of uh, going to be just sharing the things that I consider to be particularly important, some of which overlap quite a bit with the textbooks, uh, textbook and others of which uh, do not as much. Um, so this will mostly be my take on Tang Song China um, and my highlights thereof. There are more details in the textbook in some cases than uh, what I'm covering here. So still do the textbook reading as always uh, and keep up with that. Today we're going to focus on these two high points in China, the Tang and Song. Really you could look at them as one kind of extended high point with some breaks in the middle, actually more than one break. Uh, we're going to look at the Chinese exam system. Um, and also its links to things like Neo-Confucianism and uh, increased literacy in, in China, uh, pre-modern China. Uh, we're going to look at this question of the Song uh, as modern or the Tang Song as modern. Uh, we're going to look at places like the gardens of Suzhou um, and, you know, a lot of other interesting things. Uh, China's only female emperor, uh, for example, or empress, uh, empress regnant. Um, but I want to go ahead and dive right in here first with this map. Uh, this is a pretty good map that I've just found on the web. Uh, the book also has some useful maps, and I have some other maps today. Um, but you can see here, just roughly looking at it, that the older Tang Dynasty uh, has this kind of funny shape, uh, and it's significantly larger than the Song Dynasty. Uh, and the shape extends out into the desert, into the Gobi, uh, and along the, the kind of Central Asian Silk Road. Um, and that the Tang were a much more extensive empire than the Song, which shrunk over time. So the Northern Song, or the, the initial Song dynasty, is fairly large, covers uh, the bulk of what we consider to be kind of the heart of China, including places like modern Beijing, uh, Xi'an or Chang'an being the capital of the Tang dynasty. Um, and then uh, also the, the Song dynasty is divided in half, and here we see roughly the border of the Southern Song, which shrinks back to the Yangtze River uh, plain and further south and becomes a significantly geographically smaller area, but it's still extremely culturally important and it's dense in terms of kind of urbanized density. We have uh, a very large population living in the smallest China yet uh, since the inception of, let's say, the Qin uh, and the Han. Um, yet still, this is a very vibrant place that is being uh, shrunk down due to increased competition from the north. And some of this competition is coming from the Mongols and their competitors, the Jin or Jurchen being the first to invade northern China, and then the Mongols swinging through uh, later on, a uh, century and a half or so later, and wiping through uh, northern and southern China and ending the Song Dynasty. We'll get back to them. Uh, next week, we'll have a lecture on the Mongols. Um, but just to go ahead and get moving here, uh, close my webcam there. Um, we'll bring back our, our dynastic list here, our handy dandy list of all of the dynasties, not all of which we're talking about in detail in this course. Um, but I thought it would be important to maybe first, before we dive into the Tang and Song, talk about all these other dynasties uh, that you see on here, a lot of the shorter lived ones, for example, the five dynasties peri uh, period right here, which is between the Tang and the Northern Song. We have this 53 year technically uh, period of five dynasties and 10 kingdoms is what it's called. Um, 
And the reason why we're not going to talk about these too much is, uh, number one, we don't have time. Uh, there's simply too much detail to go into in this course to talk about all of these smaller dynasties and kingdoms and these fragmented periods. And second, because the five dynasties and the ten kingdoms, for example, is largely a consequence of the fragmentation of the Tang dynasty and then ends with the reunification of the Song dynasty. So this, these shorter periods in between the larger, more substantial dynasties are important on a broad scale if you're looking at Chinese history specifically, but to world history, to a global history course like this, we really want to stick with the bigger, more substantial, more influential dynasties like the Tang and Song as the ones we focus on. Um, and, and so we're going to skip over some of these shorter lived dynasties, which overlap often and uh, interrupt some of these bigger ones that we're talking about today. If you're interested in the Tung Sung transition as a field of study, it is it's almost its own field of study. Uh, this is an interesting article on the changes in the Tung Sung transition model. Um, and you can get to this, I believe, through LaGuardia. And you can also read these for free on the JSTOR website. I think they let you read like 100 a month of their articles. Um, and this is something that's been described by historians, this Tang Song transitional period, or the Tang Song as a particularly important age in China um, by uh, foreign historians here by a Japanese historian, Naito Konan, since really the early 1900s. Um, and it has been taken seriously as a particularly key pair of dynasties to understanding old China since then, uh, at least. And this is an interesting article on the history of that. If you're into this period, that'd be an article you could use if you were going to write your second paper, for example, on a source from the Tang or the Song Dynasty. You could use that as one of your secondary sources. Uh, more on that later in the week. Um, the uh, Tang is at its maximum extent also includes, and we should talk about for just a second here at least, protectorates. Um, early in the Tang Dynasty, uh, there are also areas that are not China, and even China does not believe them to be China at this time, but they are areas where China has close diplomatic ties and military outposts um, that extend along the Central Asian Silk Road into North Central Asia and into uh, Southeast Asia, what is now Vietnam. Um, and these protectorates are stronger earlier in the Tang Dynasty and weaker later. So if the Tang Dynasty starts in the you know, early 7th century, around 618 is the technical start date, um, by around 751, uh, these are notably weaker uh, due to some conflicts with uh, the Islamic Empire and with uh, you know, the far, what is, to, what is to China, the far west um, in what is now Central Asia or the Middle East. Um, these protectorates begin to weaken and fall. And you can see some of the dates here. And I've, I think I've stole this map from Wikipedia or another, uh, another encyclopedia. But uh, this map is very good at showing these protectorates. Um, and we're not going to talk about them individually or in much depth, once again, because we just don't have time. But the Tang Dynasty starts out in this position of strength and it weakens over time. That's what you need to think about. And the Song Dynasty continues this. So the Song Dynasty is smaller than the Tang Dynasty, and the wider empire of the Song is weaker than the wider empire of the Tang. So this image here shows you the, the kind of largest extent of Tang influence, not necessarily the empire itself, but influence, um, and what this map calls like loose control, um, all the way back in the seventh century. And then it is weakening over time. So once again, history is not the story of direct progress, direct growth in all places and times. It is the story of ups and downs. And here we see a particular up in the early tongue, and it is heading downward thereafter in terms of geographical control. And yet, if you look at it in terms of things like culture, uh, literacy, governance, technology, it is also still going up into the Song Dynasty. And we'll see a lot of that. Uh, today. So the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907. Um, the center of the Tang is Chang'an, now known as Xi'an, X-I-A-N. Um, and at its height in the Tang Dynasty, 
it is the largest city on earth, uh, with, you know, between a million and two million people in it, depending on the source you look at and depending on the time. Um, so this is quite a large city and we don't really have a clear sense of population, but the population of China as a whole is probably between 50 and 100. 100 is very generous million people, um, probably closer to 60 to 70, somewhere in there is realistic. Um, the Chinese government at this time was taking censuses of households. And so then you kind of have to guesstimate based on how many people are in a household. But the uh, effectiveness of this census is highly debatable. Whether or not they actually got to every household in China is extremely unlikely. Uh, so you take the official governmental uh, estimates of the time and you have to kind of extrapolate from there. And these vary over time, but 50 to 100 million, probably in 60 to 70 million people. This is one of the most densely populated places on earth, even in the Tang Dynasty. And it becomes more dense in the Song as the population continues to expand into a smaller and smaller empire. Um, Chang'an is the capital of... Uh, 10 to 12 dynasties, something like that. Um, but it, heat, it hits this new peak in the Sui and the Tang. The, the Tang is preceded by the Sui, and it takes this shape, this very geometrical shape of a square or a rectangle with the uh, palace in the north and various di districts surrounding it. It's important to note that these are not individual buildings. These are whole chunks and neighborhoods and districts. And the full size of Chang'an at this time is, you know, the footprint, I've seen it compared to San Francisco. This is a big city. Um, so San Francisco today. This is a very big city. And if this reminds you of anything, remember that uh, Japanese diagram of the Heian capital, it is modeled directly after Chang'an. So Chang'an is this source of political, administrative, geographical organization that is then emulated by Japan and others, uh, but very directly in the design of the Japanese capital. Um, the city was largely abandoned in the final decades of the dynasty uh, in the early 10th century, late 9th, early 10th century, um, as we see a lot of rebellions, banditry, and natural disasters that plague the Tang government. And as the uh, Song Dynasty begins and begins to shift southward, we see, uh, we see a shift away from Chang'an, this great capital, over time. Um, one notable ruler of the early Tang uh, is Empress Wu, Wu Zetian, uh, Wu Zetian um, who um, she is technically an emperor or an empress regnant for 15 years, which is a pretty good run by itself. But her broader control of power uh, lasts for close to 50 years, about 50 years, as uh, the emperor, uh, who she was an advisor and uh, concubine to and wife to, um, had a stroke. And so she was kind of like a co-ruler along with him. Um, so she was also highly influential before she was technically the empress for 15 years. She's a controversial figure. And you can probably guess why from what we've learned about Confucianism. Um, Confucianism is a highly patriarchal system, right? And this is the only female emperor in the history of China uh, from the chin on down. Um, so to have a female leader atop this highly patriarchal system creates lots of rumors, lots of kind of acidic uh, feelings towards this ruler, although in reality, her rule is highly effective and she's one of the reasons the Tang is so expansive and so much bigger than the Song and includes, you know, some of these larger extended regions of control is because of her abilities as a statesperson, as a politician, as a uh, leader. Um, so there's a, a, an interesting article here from the Smithsonian Magazine, um, which you can read, which I think is quite useful, quite accurate. It's not by an expert uh, on China specifically, but it's by a skilled journalist who's clearly done his research. Um, and this is one of his quotes about her. I won't read the whole thing to you, but he talks a little bit about some of these uh, allegations against Empress Wu, rumors about murders, including the murder of family members, kind of deceitfulness, 
uh, a lot of which we can't really uh, verify historically at all a lot of the time. So um, some of some of these rumors were probably started specifically because she was a woman, right? Because she was China's first female ruler and only female ruler for the its dynastic history. Um, so uh, don't take too much of the rumor to heart. She was an extremely capable and powerful politician and statesperson. And uh, it's also stated here that, you know, she is one of the early promoters of printing, for example, of this great rise in scholarship that we see in the Tang and Sung dynasty comes from Empress Wu, uh, which will have a huge impact moving forward on China in general, all of Chinese history, and especially on the system of scholar officials and of uh, the exam system that we see becoming really prominent in the Tang and Sung dynasty, technically really uh, started up in the Sui dynasty in this form, but uh, really becomes refined in the Tang and then more so in the Song dynasties. Um, the Tang dynasty sees uh, the kind of uh, creation, the invention of woodblock printing. Uh, woodblock printing, if you're not familiar with it, uh, these are two examples of woodblock printing. This would be multiple woodblocks kind of attached together after being printed on paper. Um, and it is the carving of a single block of wood into multiple lines of text that stand out on the block. And then you press ink onto that block and then press it onto paper. You can press it many times, hundreds of times, at least, if not thousands of times, depending on the quality of the carving, the hardness of the wood, etc. And you're able to, for the first time in history, uh, mass produce texts and images. And here is one of the earliest surviving prints on paper, a copy of the Diamond Sutra found in the caves of Mogao and Dunhuang, which we'll talk about uh, when we talk about the Mongols. Um, but uh, and, and the Silk Road, which I'm going to combine uh, into their own lecture. And we see woodblocks uh, surviving from the early 7th century. So the blocks themselves often survive better than the prints on paper do, as you could imagine. Um, and so this development of printing in terms of society more broadly uh, means more and more people have access to written materials. Instead of, instead of needing to hire a person to copy a book for you, a, a scribe, to hand write out a new copy of a book for you, you can buy a printed copy of a book. And this means the written word is much more available for much cheaper uh, to a much larger audience. So instead of there existing, you know, 10 or 20 copies of a book that's been manually copied, you know, nine to 19 times in that example, there might now be thousands of copies of a book out there because after your first set of wood blocks breaks down, you can create another one and then run off another 100, 500,000 copies of a book or of a, you know, a, a scroll form book. Um, so this means that uh, starting with the early Tang Dynasty, the written word is really out there and available for more people than ever before. And this Diamond Sutra is one really great example. Uh, and you can look at it here uh, in this collection here in the British Library. Um, if you click on it, you get a really good image of this uh, print, which, you know, even still today, this is ex extremely readable. Uh, anyone who can read uh, Chinese can probably read some of this, uh, some of this scroll today, even. Um, Maybe difficult because it's very old Chinese, but you could probably still get some of it. Um, with this expansion in printing, um, and certainly linked to it, comes an expansion of the civil service system. And you can read about it here if you want. Uh, this is a good, uh, good source on it from Columbia. Uh, the civil service system is an important vehicle of social mobility in Imperial China. So uh, here's an important quote. Even a youth from the poorest family could theoretically join the ranks of the educated elite by succeeding in the examination system. So we see social mobility come about with the advent of both printed word and an increased emphasis on education throughout China. You'll see uh, various estimates of literacy 
Um, in the Song Dynasty, up to perhaps 40 or 50 percent of men would have the ability to read and write and some ability to have gone to school in their life, maybe only for a couple of years, you know, among peasants. Um, and women would probably have 10 to 15 percent uh, literacy, a, a smaller amount. Yes, but still much more than ever before. Um, so we have a populace that is, you know, 20 to 30 percent literate in the Tang and Song dynasty. And it is cr increasing throughout these dynasties. This is like at the high point, 30 percent like literate. Um, and this means that people even from poorer walks of life might be able to hire a tutor for their son and hope that he could one day become a scholar official, which would you know, greatly increase his chances of social mobility in life. A scholar official is a very high uh, ranking person in society, even if they're a local scholar official for a very kind of podunk part of China, they are still a high ranking member of that community. Um, only men were admitted to this system. Uh, unfortunately here, once again, we see the patriarchal nature of the Confucian belief system. Um, wherein the scholar official class is exclusively male. Um, but this system does lead to views of the Tang Dynasty as a second coming of the classical age um, and a hearkening back to the Han. And this image of the Tang and Sung Dynasty uh, still exists today as a real second golden age or second and third golden age in Chinese history. It's also a further realization of the early ideals of Confucius that we studied in our lecture on Chinese philosophy, classical Chinese philosophy. Um, and this is, you know, Confucius finally getting what he had hoped of seeing the most qualified people in the most, uh, you know, important positions of government, both local and central. Uh, we also see in the Tang Dynasty, the early development of Neo-Confucianism, um, which I think I have a slide on this a little bit later, but Neo-Confucianism is really the separation of Confucianism from other philosophical uh, ideals like Taoism um, or Buddhism. And in particular, Buddhism is shunned uh, beginning mostly in the Song Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is it's still all mixed together and the Tang Dynasty sees some important developments in Buddhism. The Song Dynasty sees a decline in Buddhism, at least in official circles in China. It's not that no one is you know, practicing Buddhism anymore, but that elites and scholars are kind of discouraged from following Buddhism uh, in the late Tang and Song Dynasties. And this is Neo-Confucianism. We do see uh, significant developments in Buddhism, particular in, uh, particularly in Chan Buddhism. Uh, Chan Buddhism is, uh, and you can read about it here in our uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Once again, an excellent resource with a lot of writing on this topic. You know, it, it's really a short article with a lot of useful links to other primary and secondary sources. Um, it is a meditative practice wherein you meditate on your own or you work with a master to meditate. Um, and it has both practical and ethical elements and esoteric and philosophical religious elements on both how to live your life and how to treat others and also how to, uh, you know, do things like escape the cycle of uh, death and rebirth. Um, there are two useful quotes that I'm taking here from the standard uh, Stanford Encyclopedia. Um, the first is that the harmony of body and mind that reaches out through all four limbs, benefiting what cannot be benefited and doing what can't be done is one of the things that meditation lets you do. It lets you get out of the limitations of your body and of the physical world and escape it kind of at least for a short time into this mental world. And then the Song Dynasty, the belief in Chan Buddhism and meditative uh, Buddhism um, is broken down into four parts. There's a special transmission of knowledge outside the scriptures. Um, this transmission is not established on words and letters because there's a belief in Zen Buddhism that words and letters are ultimately the creation of mankind and therefore imperfect, and they can't transmit the reality of the world to you. So you have to kind of come to that yourself. Um, directly pointing to the human heart mind, that is your inner mind, um, and seeing nature and becoming a Buddha. So uh, the belief here is that through meditation, you get a direct conduit to the cosmic universal truth of Buddhism and a better chance at becoming a Buddha yourself.
Uh, as I said previously, this becomes very popular in places like Japan, uh, where Zen Buddhism is uh, really something that warrior elites latch on to as, you know, this is self-reliance built into this and you finding enlightenment yourself lines up very closely with martial philosophy. So it takes off very quickly in both China and Japan as it's passed along. Um, and it's the lag between the transmission from one to the other is starting to uh, be reduced. Communication between China and Japan and Korea as, as three parts of the East Asian sphere and also China and Southeast Asia, which you saw parts of Vietnam were part of one of these protectorates earlier in the Tong, um, really starts to shorten. You start to see communication and transmission of knowledge very quickly in this sphere. This is part of the evidence of the Silk Roads we should really say Silk Roads, uh, is, is becoming more interlinked, more closely combined and unified as there are monocultures of things like Buddhism that cross these uh, otherwise clear boundaries between empires and kingdoms. Um, we see the decline of the central state in the Tang Dynasty in the late 8th and early 9th century um, until right at the start of the 10th century, the Tang collapses. Um, but its functions, the functions of the state, for example, the uh, regulation of the economy starts to be uh, regulated by merchants, by thriving economic forces. So although the, the political center of the Tang in Chang'an is weakening, the economy is still thriving and it's just the government is uh, benefiting less directly from this. Um, after the end of the Tang Dynasty, there are you know, multiple rebellions, multiple uprisings that topple the Tang. Uh, there's issues with banditry that just cannot be dealt with by the Tang military. And uh, China fragments for about 50 years into this uh, five dynasties and 10 kingdoms period that we see on our dynastic list there from the beginning of this lecture. But once again, I'm not going to talk too much about that. You can see some of this uh, fragmentation. Uh, you can see in 1994, Encyclopedia Britannica was calling this the later Tang, which is it's really after the Tang as we see it now. Uh, but there's still a Tang core existing. Um, once again, one factor in all of this may also be climate change. Um, and this is a debate that you can look at. Um, so the climate link being questioned here and the climate link being uh, argued here. These are two articles from 2007 and 2008 when this was a topic of some debate in the academic community. It remains a topic of debate now. Um, and there are obvious political reasons for climate change to be looked at maybe as for or not for uh, a major reason for the collapse of the tongue uh, that affect us today. Uh, if, you, if you want to reject climate science today and say uh, it's not a problem, then maybe you would want to also reject it in the past. Um, but one argument is that there was a famine due to a drying up in the Northern Tongue uh, region and a lack of water for crops that may have caused too much hunger among the people of the Tang dynasty and thus many uprisings and rebellions. But that's just one argument. I'm not saying that it's 100% true. Um, after about 50 years of fragmentation, you could really look at it as about 100 years of fragmentation from the last 50 years of the Tang to this 50 years of pure fragmentation. Um, we see the reunification of the bulk of China under the Song Dynasty under Emperor Taizu. This is a process that takes place through throughout his uh, early period of rule, in which the Song Dynasty reclaims much of the core of Tang uh, control, but not all of it. As you'll see, there are multiple people from the north who retain uh, significant chunks of power. And these are, uh, in, the, in the case of the Jin, uh, who take over for the Liao later, um, northern steppe nomads, semi-nomadic peoples coming from the area north of the Korean peninsula and swooping in to take over much of the northern Song over time. Um, these are uh, a group of people that predate the Mongols, um, the Mongols are, are still existing up further to the north, but predate the kind of real expansion of the Mongols um, under Genghis Khan and uh, whose 
kind of structure of society looks kind of like a combination of Chinese and Mongol society, where they, they are more sedentary than the Mongols, who are highly nomadic, but less uh, sedentary than the Chinese. And they are, uh, you know, pastoralists. They have both agriculture and herding and hunting as the main sources of food. Um, and so we gradually see these people from the north invading into the more sedentary Song Dynasty. Um, Song Dynasty sees a booming population, as I've already mentioned. And these two maps are quite good for the northern and southern Song. You can see the southern Song is pushed down into this basically the Yellow River Plain, and it, it shrinks more and more over time. This is the Southern Song at its largest. It gets smaller than this uh, later on. Um, important aspects of the Song Dynasty, I'm going to talk about some technology. Uh, we see the world's first paper money, at least that we know of, um, and there's a nice article here on the Song uh, Economic Revolution from Columbia. Um, and I'll go ahead and just read this to you. The use of paper currency was initiated by merchants. So merchants are the ones creating the first kind of deposit slips. They're not really money yet, but they're deposit slips that say, instead of carrying around hundreds of pounds or even thousands of pounds of strings of coins, let's just keep all the coins in one place uh, in these deposit shops, these kind of banks. Um, and I'm going to give you a piece of paper that is linked to this bank that says you can go withdraw your money when any, whenever you need, um, and we can go ahead and trade our things like uh, various goods, rice, uh, you know, metals, finished goods, etc., uh, cattle, or whatever else you're trading, and I don't have to bring a thousand pounds of coins to you because that's kind of a pain, right? It's a pain for both parties in this transaction. Um, so by 900 CE, these are happening. These trading slips are being traded uh, kind of like money. And in the 1120s, the government, the Song government comes in and says, okay, there is a use for these slips and we're gonna take over and create a government backed currency for the first time. This is one example of such a note. Um, so this currency is a sign of really complex economic thinking. Things like loans are probably easier and uh, more abstract to deal with now. Uh, purchases can be made across long distances without actually carrying uh, goods and money back and forth. You could carry goods both directions now, for example. If I'm someone who transports goods with you know, a team of carts and helpers and I normally transport 20,000 pounds of goods, uh, across a 50 mile span, I can now take goods both ways instead of goods one way and money the other. This doubles the kind of throughput of the economy in, in, uh, in essence. And so the creation of paper money uh, is one of the arguments that we'll see uh, or that you see in, in writing for the idea of the Song Dynasty as maybe the world's first modern society. Um, Arts and culture are booming. We see the gardens of Suzhou, just one example. Suzhou is a city uh, near modern Shanghai um, where uh, we see a blooming of these gardens. There are about a dozen of these very large gardens like the one you see on the, on the picture on the left here. These are places people go to have parties, to discuss philosophy, to uh, talk about the things they are learning in their educations. And they are largely an, an abode of the elite, but occasionally they'll be open to the public. Um, and this is a, a real sign that people have both leisure time to spend in places like this to discuss things that do not matter to their survival, um, and that they have wealth significant enough to spend on places like this as private citizens. They're not uh, they're not emperors. They're not kings and queens. These are just private citizens with this much money. Uh, so this capitalistic world of the Song is clearly hustling and bustling. Uh, and you can read more. The Gardens of Suzhou are a UNESCO site, so I'll share the UNESCO uh, website for them here. You can read all about them if you'd like. And there are gardens like this in multiple cities across the Song Dynasty. This, the ones in Suzhou are some of the nicest. Um, famously places where you would go and read and write poetry. 
Um, we see the development of things like gunpowder and other technologies. This is fairly well known. You've probably heard of this. Um, here's a mechanical clock based on a water clock. Uh, weaponry, including the so-called fierce fire oil cabinet. It's like the world's first flamethrower. Uh, shipbuilding sees a huge uh, kind of amount of growth. And this period still predates the period of Zheng He, the Chinese Christopher Columbus, quote unquote, that I showed you earlier in the term. Um, but the expansion of Chinese fleets, um, we start to see in this period, the Song Dynasty has a standing navy. Part of why they're able to defend themselves along the Yangtze River is because they're able to have a navy on the Yangtze River and on the coast around it. Um, and uh, this is also linked to the creation of the magnetic north-south compass, which is very useful in navigation. And I have links to all these things here for you. If you want to read about them, for example, the compass here, we have a little science article about it uh, on things like shipbuilding, I believe. We have some things here from Columbia um, and the compass, which are obviously linked together. Anyway, technology is really moving right along in the Song Dynasty. So even more of an argument for a modern period. We see a move from, um, or rather in addition to woodblock printing, we see movable type printing. Uh, first with wooden blocks that are movable within a frame um, and then onto metal type. Uh, I think Korea might've been the first with metal type. I don't, know, don't quote me on that. Um, but the move to movable type printing is even more convenient than woodblock printing, because now instead of having to carve an entire perfect tablet of wood uh, print that you then impress on a page, you can do individual characters, kind of like individual letters, although they're, all, they're Chinese characters, so it's a little different. Um, and as those wear out, you just replace one character. This means you can print even more than you could before in the Tang Dynasty. You can print more reliably. Uh, you can print more things more regularly. If a book is uh, very popular, you can create multiple editions of it very quickly. If a book is not popular, you can reuse the characters in other books, for example. Um, so movable type printing is very important to the even further expansion of education and knowledge in Song China. And in Song China, we see Neo-Confucianism, which I talked about earlier, a development really of the early Tang, um, which takes over in the Song Dynasty. So Neo-Confucianism is um, this idea, Zhu Xi, this person on the bottom right, is one of the main proponents of Neo-Confucianism that uh, Chinese political philosophy in particular does not need foreign ideas or really kind of uh, uh, religious ideas within it. More practical grounded matters of the state are the things that scholars should be learning about when they take these civil service exams in order to become uh, officials of the government. <clears throat> so this is a, a very good quote here. Um, from uh, University of Washington. You can read about this if you want in a little bit more detail here, but I'll go ahead and read it to you uh, with these, these kind of highlighted sections in particular importance. Buddhism reached a creative and flourishing peak during the Tang Dynasty. And this is where we say Sichuan Buddhism, for example, coming out. But the Song Dynasty saw a reaction from the for to the foreign religion and a creative revitalization of the stagnant Confucian tradition. In the political world, this took the form of a reform movement, which attempted to address the pressing socioeconomic problems of the day by a creative reinterpretation of ancient ideal Confucian institu institutions. So this is seen as the revival of real Confucianism, uh, quote unquote. Um, but of more lasting importance was the intellectual and spiritual reshaping of the tradition in a, mil in a milieu of... Uh, Long shaped by Buddhist predominance, men again began to take the Confucian classics seriously. So there are these very old texts that were uh, around even before Confucius that Confucius builds his ideas on, and they become the real heart, the real core of this civil service system and civil service examination system. Not surprisingly, they found what they were looking for 
a long lost ascetical doctrine dealing with the cultivation of the inner life of the mind, and a metaphysics that could frame this with a philosophical account of sagehood, self-cultivation, and ultimately the universe. So if you want to read about Zushi, you can here. There's also a really good uh, half-hour lecture here uh, by Professor Kenneth Hammond from New Mexico State here. I have linked from YouTube uh, if you're interested in Neo-Confucianism. Neo-Confucianism, another excellent topic you could look at for the source paper because there's a lot of writing about it from the time uh, that is in translation. So we see the further refining of the civil service and exam system and a shift to a true system of scholar elites. So the time of a mixed scholarship and military class and aristocratic class, which endured through the Tang Dynasty, really fades away. And the bulk of the people uh, working in China as uh, representatives of the government are scholar elites, regardless of their background, who have done extremely well in the exam system and proven themselves to have a very strong understanding of the Confucian classics. These classics are applied practically in the exam, exam system in terms of how you would deal with a particular situation uh, and there are kind of particular answers. Some people try to cheat um, and eventually uh, a system of exam cells even uh, comes about where you're locked into a room for about two or three days. I think it's three days most of the time where you take the exams in these rooms. And this has some precedent earlier in history uh, so that you can cannot cheat at all on these exams. Um, later on uh, in the 18th century, we see a shift in the perception of the Chinese hero, which starts really in the Tang and Song periods. Um, and the Chinese hero shifts from being uh, a heavenly ruler who has this kind of auspicious help from uh, unknown uh, cosmic forces to a more grounded, educated elite and a true Neo-Confucian. And one example of this is Judge D. Uh, and there are lots of these translated novels of Judge D. Uh, and I'm having you listen to a, a bit of a podcast about Judge D because our understanding of Judge D comes as much from uh, Robert Van Gulick, the Dutch translator of many of these old stories as it does from the Chinese themselves. But these Judge D stories are very much like, you know, the television show Law and Order or Law and Order Special Victims Unit, especially because they often deal with uh, sex crimes and they're very salacious. Um, but these are uh, cases wherein this kind of Sherlock Holmes-esque always gets the guy and the, his, his, his man in the end, detective, um, examining all of these cases of downtrodden poor people who've been mistreated by people who do not understand the Confucian virtues. So the cases of Judge D are a later development, but this is a person, theoretically, a uh, semi-legendary person from the Tang Dynasty who is doing all of this detective work. Um, so these are uh, future accounts of people back in the past. And this image really comes from this shift to Neo-Confucianism in the Song Dynasty. Um, the fall of the Song Dynasty, it, in part, is something we'll be studying as we get into the Mongols uh, next week. But uh, the Asian Art Museum has a good uh, summary of this. The rule of the Song ended in 1279 when Mongol leader Kublai Khan, who's the grandson of Genghis Khan, having conquered the Jurchen regime in northern China, swept through southern China and brought the Song territories entirely within the fold of the newly proclaimed Yuan dynasty. So after the Song dynasty, we get the Yuan, who we'll talk about next time uh, or next week. Um, and they are a Mongol-led Chinese dynasty. It's very fascinating. I'll talk about it for at least a few minutes. Um, and that begins another story. The Tang and Song dynasties, fraternal twin dynasties of China's medieval period, stand out as among the most accomplished of all civilizations in global history. They gave the world many contributions and helped to shape Chinese civilization into what it is today. So it sounds like the Asian Art Museum might agree with this argument that the Tang Song in China might be one of the world's first modern places or modern eras. Um, but kind of wonder what you think about it. I'm not going to inject my opinion too much, 
uh, maybe I have a little bit, but I think uh, this is something we could debate and discuss. What is modernity? And this has already come up in your discussions, I believe. It's on the board already for a few weeks ago. Um, and this might be something I could ask you a little bit later on, uh, you know, on the discussion board or in one of your short answers. But thinking about modernity, what is missing uh, in the Song Dynasty from a modern culture? What, what else would they have needed? What do you think? Um, I think there are many things that come to mind they could have probably had that they didn't that make us think of ourselves as being more modern, uh, gender equality being uh, maybe the most obvious, but um, or a greater degree of it, at least. But um, the technological leaps and political ideals of the period do tend to lend themselves to thinking of the Tang and Song as something particularly interesting and new uh, in Chinese history and world history in general, which is part of why I've given them so much time here. Uh, you can read more about the civil service exam system, about Neo-Confucianism on your own in all of the links I've given you today. Um, but I want to wrap this up, try not to make it too long. And for next time, we'll be talking about uh, your source analysis paper, which you should probably be getting going on at this point. Um, I know it feels probably like it's a ways away, but it really isn't. Um, it's coming up. You only have a few more weeks left in the term now. Um, and on the 17th, on Sunday, we have due your discussion responses on this topic, on Tang Song China, Buddhism across Asia. Maybe you could talk about Neo-Confucianism if you want. Um, and we have this podcast about Judge D, which I would like you to take a look at, really starting around the nine minute mark here. This is an amateur uh, kind of approach to it, but this is the China History Podcast. Uh, and I think it's kind of an interesting account of how we look back at the past, how we understand something like the Tang Dynasty through various filters, because really uh, there is a filter from the 18th century, uh, there's a filter from the 20th century, and there's a present day filter in the form of the podcast that we're looking through in this podcast through the lenses to see Judge D, uh, who was probably not even a real person at all. Anyway, um, I hope this has been helpful and informative. Uh, rem remember to do the textbook readings because they are going to fill in on a lot of the details. I'm not going through all the rote details of this history, and uh, it's probably best that you look at the textbook. For some of you, it might be better before or after these lectures, but you need to look at it in concert with these lectures to get the full picture of what I'm hoping you will learn from this course. All right, uh, so I'll see you next time on the source analysis paper, and have a good one.